Good morning, John, and thanks very much for giving up some time to talk to the Mint about social care reform. Good morning, and uh, you're welcome. Well, I thought, John, I'd start by asking you to just give an idea to people listening how you got involved in the social care area and what what you do in it. Okay, well, Vanguard, the company that I run, works in all kinds of service organisations. I think we got involved in social care, I guess, approximately 20, 22 years ago, something like oh. that. Is yeah, our work so we work with uh, local authorities, and all of our work is concerned with helping leaders understand the advantages of changing the way they think about the design and management of work, away from a command and control design and into a systems design. And we've been doing that in health and care systems. So, right? Could you this? So you work with people who are providing services, but let's and social care obviously is a service, and moving around from command and control from to a systems perspective. What's the difference between a command and control and a systems perspective? Well, the simplest distinction is command and control thinkers focus on managing costs and a systems design is focused on managing value. And when you manage costs, your costs always go up. When you learn to manage value, your costs fall out. Right. Can you give an example of what, if you were going to talk to someone who knew nothing about service or whatever, can you give a sort of very concrete example of what, well, yeah. Well, I mean, take take social care. I mean, you would imagine, wouldn't you, if your life fell off the rails and you put your hand up and said, I need help, that someone will pop along and help you. Well, that doesn't happen. You can have a number of people popping along because all of these people are looking at you through their own specialist lens and their specialist lens is governed by their budget. Uh, their budget tells them what they can spend money on and therefore what they can't spend money on. Okay, so so we, we've all here's a here's a cost measure <clears throat> limiting the conversation they can have with you. They might set thresholds that you've got to be seriously in trouble before they release some of their money. They want to protect their money. Equally, they might might decide that you need a service, and so they they, they might commission a service from a provider because the government believes in the market. And if you're going to go to the market for a price, then you have to standardise that service. But otherwise, people can't put a price on it. So another cost focus. But standardised services don't deal with the variety of people's demands. So we pay money to do things that are not effective for them. OK, so give me an example of a particular scenario of someone in need of care who ends up getting an inappropriate service then. Well, a simple one is, you know, someone who needs social contact. Well, we don't do that, but we do Meals on Wheels. So we'll, we'll send you a meal. So, so all that sort of social contact, you can't define it, commodify, determine it, etc. You can't commission it, but you can commission someone to provide a meal. Yeah, or, you know, you might have someone there helping you with your personal care, getting up in the morning, things like that, but they can't take the bin out because that's not the service that's been specified and yeah that's okay. right so yeah. if you so that's a sort of command and control cost basis if 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 it was a systems approach how would it work oh well, it's entirely different you see <clears throat> well i should say first of all what's important henry is that the leaders of these services go through the the whole exercise of studying how ineffective their design is and how it's the system conditions, so for example, the budget and commissioning and activity management, that kind of thing, that are inhibiting our ability to understand what matters to people and therefore design services that work. So when you've gone through that, you you cross the Rubicon and you say, okay, well, why don't we we consider designing a service that works? That starts in a different way. So, and this has happened a lot uh, around the UK and in other countries, you know, it now starts with everybody who puts their hand up for help gets visited immediately. Not no qualifications, no form filling, no decide who's going to be sent. Someone will come and that someone will understand you, what's happened to you, the context in which this has happened to you. They will help you define what for you is a good life or a good day. then they will help you take responsibility for achieving that uh, and then they will look to any help that you can get get from uh, your family your friends your community from the voluntary sector or indeed from state provision which is designed specifically to help you achieve the aims that you've set out so it's a bit like 
I suppose in other situations, you have a sort of account manager or something like that, uh, who you, know, you have the relationship with and they understand you and then they help you find the way through the system. And so would the would there then be a menu of things that you could provide? So in a way, the, there would still be a commissioning or, or and, and they might have a budget, would they? Or, or well, the, the menu is invented every time because you're dealing with a particular person with particular needs. It's, 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 not, it's not like, like we think about a menu. We think about how do we help this person achieve their ambition? I mean, the, the important thing about this is that the more you work this way, the more people get back on the rails quickly. That that means you can help more people more effectively with the same budget, if you want to put it that way. But now you're you actually don't... being effective in helping them. So you're actually being effective in helping them. So rather mm. than ineffective and continuously problems right. recurring and, and That's so That's right. And so you increase your capacity by doing that. So this sounds a bit like common sense in a way. Yep. And and so, why don't people listen to this? Or why, you know, you explain to me. Obviously, I'm not technical. I don't work in social care, but it makes just total obvious common sense. So why? Well, yes. Is it yes. More well, uh, I think first of all, you know, the, the the narrative in Whitehall, all the power is held in Whitehall. The narrative in Whitehall is as we are getting older, uh, living longer. <laughs> demand is rising so therefore who's going to pay okay now the fact of the matter is when you go and study demand as we help leaders do it's quite extraordinary you learn that demand is actually stable okay, okay. What, what is growing enormously is what i call failure demand you yeah, know so if we don't help people they come back this is one of the things that leaders see when they study their systems. They, they see the life story of somebody for the last, say, 20 years of all of the interactions they've had that have been effective or ineffective. And so, it, it, you know, it's, that that is, if you like, the truth. But Whitehall doesn't work on <laughs> doesn't work on knowledge, doesn't work on data, doesn't work on truth. They work on narrative. And, and, you know, so if you're a politician, wh what would you prefer to say? Would you prefer to say, well, we're living longer, demand is rising, so who's going to pay? Or would you like to say, ah, what I've learned is that the way we've designed and managed uh, care services historically is fundamentally flawed. We waste about half of the money that we invest in these services, and so we better change them. Yeah. Well, politicians don't like saying they've got things wrong. But even... The at the moment, the current government is being trying very hard to say they haven't been governing for the last 10 years and they're totally new and different, aren't they? That's the, the Johnson brilliant political trick, if you like, is yeah, to yeah. pretend that the Conservatives haven't been in charge for 10 years and now he's in charge and everything's new. So is there any possibility from that narrative that he can take, you know, then he can admit that over the last 10 whatever years that the approach has been wrong and it is possible. But well, well, we're not seeing it in all the documents being produced. I mean, you, do, you know, do remember that Boris did promise to fix it quickly, and he hasn't. Pocket didn't he about two years ago? Apparently, and that now, now, now we're, we're told that the announcements will come in the spring as to what they're going to do. But when you read the papers, as I do, of what's being talked about, I don't see anybody talking about the fundamental need to change the system and specifically the regulation that sits over it. You see, if, what, if you're what regulation is that? Well, if if you if you run a care service, then then uh, the regulators are going to turn up and see that you comply with all of the edicts from central government. You know, you 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 should be using commissioning. You should be using the market. You should be managing activity. You should be meeting your target times for assessing. You should be have good control of your budgets, and you know also these are the you know this is what makes for your reputation. Let me yeah, just give you an example of how, how powerful this is. I, I, I was working in a place in the Midlands. This is a long time ago now. This would have been in the days of the Audit Commission. You remember them. We were working for a, a county council uh, on adult social care. <laughs> we helped them study it so, so the leaders understood it was suboptimal. We helped them redesign it so they got a fantastically better service. <laughs> and then we heard that the Audit Commission was coming to do their 
their audit of the county council and their performance in social care was a major contributor to their, their audit result. They had, they had historically been a four star council, therefore super good. And the chief executive insisted that the design in the care service had to go back to the one that the audit commission would be familiar with, otherwise they might not get their four stars. So everything that they'd learned, they put aside to try and replicate what was expected. Yes, because reputation is more important than performance and you don't want to argue with the regulator. So the regulator doesn't actually look at performance. They look at whether you're <coughs> meeting what they expect to see in terms of how you're managing it. That's correct. I mean, I remember saying to Steve Bundred, who was the chief executive of the Audit Commission around that time, I remember saying to him, you know, well, well, you are a civil servant, yes. So, well, don't you think you have a duty if someone points out that things are flawed and there's a better way to do things that you should take an interest? And he simply said to me, I just don't agree with you, John. Did he give the basis on which he disagreed with your no. analysis? No. No. Did he show any curiosity to come and see things in practice that were better? No. So who is listening? You, presumably you have a business you're providing services some people yeah. are listening to you who, yes. are, who are actually who are listening uh, to you? Uh, leaders of care services i mean you know, in in wales for example smaller country they talk to each other about a third of the care services in wales follow our method and and the welsh assembly government have changed the policy regarding care services in wales as a result of that work so now in way i mean this is a really simple thing in wales the requirement is no longer to fill in a lot of forms. The, the fundamental requirement in policy is if someone's life falls off the rails, your priority is to go and understand what matters to them. Now, that might sound small, but it's quite profound. But also uh, a lot in Denmark, a lot in Sweden. You know, in Sweden, the problem they wanted to solve is how to, how to provide continuity in a relationship. Because that's so important in a care service. You don't want different people turning up all the time. You want continuity. <clears throat> but you, you've also got to design a service that is thermostatic. Because, thermostatic? You know, if, what does that mean? Well, you might need 20 minutes today, but 40 minutes tomorrow. So it goes up and down depending on what, you're, what you need. That's right. That's right. So now how do you, how do you tackle that problem? And for us, it's just a statistical problem of work, working out the predictability of demand and consumption and therefore working out how to organize the resources the helping resources such that pretty much all of the time or certainly most of the time you're going to get the same person turning up okay and so so there's a solution to that is that um... yes yes it, and, and, and we and we worked it, the first time we worked it out was in sundsvall in northern sweden yeah. And it's a and, scheduling problem, is it, basically? Yeah, right? yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, and it's, uh, you see, if you, if you can understand the predictability of demand and the types of demand and therefore what resource you need and therefore what capacity, you can start to work towards optimising continuity. So, so you model it and you, you develop the systems to do that, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you don't model it, you take the actual data. I mean, okay. you can do this, you can do the same with any repairs organisation. You know, this is this is understanding the predictability of repairs and then the time it takes to do them, what trades you need to do them. Uh, I describe in in my latest book in detail how you do that with housing repairs. And the consequence with housing repairs is you're able to deliver a repair to a tenant on the day and at the time they want it. That's quite a remarkable thing. And doing that, your costs fall. Say I was well, I am a Whitehall bureaucrat in part of my life so okay. um, and I am concerned that well if you give people everything they want well they could demand endlessly and it's going to cost them an arm and a leg well done Henry that's exactly what they think well so this is all about change you see if, if you if you go into them and say well the thing you've got to do is give people everything they want they'll go you must be mad so the first step is understanding by not giving them what they want, what it's costing you. When you sort of demonstrate that, people that, that gets people thinking. Yes, and I don't demonstrate it. This is very important from an intervention point of view. I help them study it 
and then they can't deny it. Right, so you help them find the information that shows what's happening. And, and they must do it. So this, I'm a psychologist, so this is a normative change. Right. If I tell them it's a rational approach and they argue with it because it hits their mental model, they don't like that. Yeah. So if I make them study it, they can't argue with it. That they realize that what they're currently doing in care services, for example, they realize they're wasting about half of their money. They're, they're buying things for people that don't help people, that these people keep coming back with the same issues, that these people are also hitting half a dozen other services. We're not helping them. And so in Wales, it, has the message got totally across? You said a third of Welsh. Currently, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and could it go further, do you think, or what's the... Oh, of course. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I expect it will, you know, the, the, simply because they talk to each other and it's a small community. Well, in fact, there's, there's, a, there's a whole lobbying exercise going on uh, amongst the people who, who work this way from both the public sector and the voluntary sector. <clears throat> they are lobbying the, the, the Minister uh, for Social Care to, to rethink a lot of the things that are coming out of, what do they call it now, the Senate, isn't it? They call it something like that. What used to call it the Welsh Assembly government, right, okay, right. <laughs> and that, that's 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 those you know, and, uh, and they get listened to. You know, when Mark Drakeford, is, is he the, he's the minister, uh, Drakeford. Yeah, he he was previously the minister for social care, and the policy ch changed under his watch. Right. Well, that's good. That's really good. So, can you sort of show also in terms of the data that the places where they've implemented this approach of immediately supporting people, providing what they need, works in terms of both financially yes. and in terms of uh, outcomes? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, it costs less to help people properly. You help more people more effectively, fewer people going into hospital, fewer people placing demands on other services. And, and actually, well, here, here's something that might interest you. Have you heard of Bird Talk? Yes, I think I've... Uh, and, and I've that that's a sort of model from uh, the Netherlands, was it? That's right. That's right. And 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 so you know, being being pretty stupid, quite a lot of our leaders thought, oh, that's interesting. We'll copy it. Now, let me say first of all that the results in Bertsorg are the same as the results from from what we do. You know, more effective help, less demand elsewhere, less failure demand. All good. But so you know. So we have the, I mean, Tony Blair had this idea with choice based letting. He said, Oh, look, the Dutch are doing choice. Let's steal it and pilot it. And so we've done the same with Bert's Organ Social Care. And people think these pilots are all about self managed teams. <clears throat> and we need to put these self managed teams out there as a little pilot exercise, see how they get along. And they don't recognize they've got to change the system that sits around them. They think they've managed them in the same way. And so the results of these pilots are pathetic, absolutely pathetic. So I, I, I did a, a, a podcast all about, you've got to understand what happened to Just a Block. Just a Block is the man who invented Birdsall. And, and he, it, it's, it's, again, it's a normative change. You see, he was working as a care worker in the Netherlands and he grew up the hierarchy at the same time as this new public management stuff came in. You know, which is all about cost, it's all about outsourcing, all about commissioning, etc. And he could see it was wrong. <laughs> and by the time he'd got to a quite a senior position, and he was arguing that this was wrong. Now, he didn't get listened to. He got ostracised. So he buggered off, left, he left, and he went to the Ukraine to work for a couple of years. Right. When he got back to the Netherlands, the government had realised that, that they had a crisis in social care, they said, here's a pot of money. We want anybody to come up with any idea. We will fund ideas. We're not going to run it from central government. And so Joster Block put forward his proposal. He got funded. It worked. And then it grew. But what people don't realise is that the thing we have to go through as leaders in this country is the same normative experience that he went through. What's wrong? We've got we've got to understand why it doesn't work in order to work out how to make it work. Fascinating. So you've got a lot of proof of the solution in Wales. Yeah. Uh, and, well, and in England and in Denmark and in Sweden and in Australia. And 
social care reform is now on the agenda, isn't it? And it's in the media and so on. Are you getting coverage there? Is there interest? Is there a TV pro documentary coming up that's going to point out these things? No. Why is, why is that? Well, I, I think it's because, I mean, when I listen to the radio, <clears throat> I'm a Radio 4 news listener, and I get very angry when the presenters <clears throat> just don't ask the right questions. They, they kind of share the narrative. Uh, and even even if, even if I write, I mean, I, I sent my, well, one of my people sent the, the Burke's Talk podcast to Justin Webb because he was talking about the, the problems that he had with his mother going through the care system. Right. And he, 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 he replied, so it's fascinating. It's a word he uses quite a lot. But he still, you know, he and all of the others are unable to ask the right questions because they haven't got that mental frame, as it were. You know, these are hard questions as well. You know, do you know, Minister, just how much failure demand there is on the health and care system? Yeah. I suppose <laughs> you then have to define, define what failure demand was. There was a, a, a Wellbeing Economy Alliance publication recently about failure demand, which goes even larger, that says, you know, so often we are creating problems that then cost us huge amounts across the piece, that this is, this is a pervasive a systemic problem. Mm. Do you think that's right? Uh, well, I don't, I'm not familiar with that paper. You know, of all of the concepts I've developed, failure demand has got the fastest legs. Uh, and I, I, I often say it's easily understood, but also easily misunderstood. How is it misunderstood? How can well, it be conventional command and control thinkers get the idea that there's this thing called failure demand, uh, which is I define as caused by a failure to do something or do something right for the customer. So it's defined outside in. It's a very strong operational definition. <clears throat> and they immediately assume that the causes are people not doing their jobs or processes not working right. And they're wrong. It, it's systemic. You know, so in care services, for example, if you're focused on activity management, if you're focused on caseload management, if you're focused on budgets, if you're focused on specialization, standardization, commissioning, all of those things will create failure demand. So it's quite a big thing to take on board that, yes, it's not people out there failing. It's the people who are running, designing, in charge of the system who are failing. That's correct. Yeah, it's systemic and therefore the responsibility is right at the top. Right. And, so, you know, we think about the care service uh, review. The thing that I've noticed about Josh McAllister's work is he doesn't talk about regulation, which is the most important thing. It's how we control the whole system. Where do you think this, this blindness is coming from? Well, I mean, I think to be fair, we don't teach people to think like this. We teach them, you know, you go to business school and you learn that organisations are all about finance. And are the people from business school, the people who are running the system? Because I thought not many people, I suppose, go to business school and go to Whitehall, do they? I mean, Whitehall's more people brought up in the Whitehall system, treasury and, and so on. And... Lots of, yes, lots of philosophers. Ah, well, actually, and economists. Well, I both I take both of your boxes actually because I studied oh. philosophy and then I studied economics. But actually, as a result of studying <laughs> philosophy, it helped me understand all of the disastrous failings in the way economics is taught. <laughs> that actually, yeah. I, yeah. I would put my money on philosophy being better than economics. Which I'd is, agree. <laughs> uh, more like a brainwashing uh, approach than actually. Well, like, it makes not. you think in constructive ways, whereas, as, 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 you, as I'm sure you're aware, economics wishes it had the ability to be a science, but clearly doesn't. Right. So, just to end on it, what can you give us in terms of positive sort of hope moving forward that this thinking <laughs> will spread further? Well, because it doesn't stop. You see, the important thing is that once you've crossed the Rubicon, you now can see the difference between the way you should think and the way you used to think you, you never go back you know which is accounts for the growth of our work around the world really but also you know it's an inhibitor to growth because the way to get it is to engage and do these 
normative studying things. So it will always be slow because people, you know, leaders of organisations don't think they need to learn things. No, no, no. They didn't get to where they are today. But you know, everyone who's crossed the Rubicon carries on, which is also where our work comes from, you know. It, so if, for example, we work for a major UK bank, lots of leaders understand it, get it. You know, if they say, for example, they've got a new chief executive comes in and reimposes all the, the old stupidity, these people leave, they go to other places, they see the same issues and they call us in and we help them. Well, I wish you the best of luck then in spreading the message and I will look out, I will become that more aware, more aware of the fact that the wrong questions are being asked in social media and the social care debate. And I, I also hope that someone asks the right questions. <laughs> well, have you have you read uh, my most recent book? I don't think I've got it here. No, uh, do beyond... tell us about it. Or yes, we can put <clears throat> information about it in the on, on the web page by the interview. So okay. Well, I think there are two that are important. The latest one is called Beyond Command and Control. Yeah. Uh, and it's all about service organisations. It's all about normative change, lots of examples, practical things. The other one, which I think might interest, well, is relevant to this, this interview today, is the Whitehall effect. Uh, if, I, if I've got a copy of it here, you might recognise the artwork on the front there. Oh, yes, yes. That's George <laughs> Strunk. But that's, I mean, I wrote this book because I'd spent oh, maybe 14, 15 years arguing with people in Westminster and I decided in 2014, I'm not going anymore. I'm fed up. You know, I first talked about this care thing with Ivan Lewis and David Bean in about 2003. You know, that's the first conversation. I've had a series of conversations with people about the care service since. No one's interested because of the narrative. I even had Grant, Grant Shapps visited a housing uh, site where they were delivering services to tenants on the day at the time they wanted when he was housing minister didn't do anything about it his next announcement was that people should do their own repairs which is a completely stupid idea it never happened so i mean i gave up talking to them and this book is everything that i'd said to them about what's wrong with public sector reform it's my dear john book <laughs> well that's wonderful well Thank, I will now read it because, uh, there's, yes, the, the latest reform in Whitehall is becoming agile. And uh, we've got an interesting time where agility has been turned into a, an inflexible system. Mm. Uh, we've got to all be agile in exactly the same way with exactly the same processes. Yes, so, it's a it is a total load of bollocks. I, I spend four chapters talking about IT and agile in the Beyond, Beyond Command and Control. Well, I will share that with my colleagues who are so keen to convert us all to... Agile working. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. My pleasure. Very nice to meet you, Henry.